Hey everyone, how you doing? Well, I'm going to be honest, folks, I wasn't planning on going live today. I wasn't. I was going to take an easy Friday. You know, my husband's been out of town for like a week and a half. He's coming back in a couple hours. And um, I was going to spend some time. I was. I was going to spend some time cleaning up, getting things all nice. And then I got an email about the University of New Hampshire doing an anti-racist webinar. And I was like, you know what? It's Friday. I have not done a happy hour live stream in a minute. And so why not just steal a few of my husband's beers? Because that's like that's like two full beers right there. Put them in my wine glass. I was originally going to have um, some champagne because my husband in his uh, in his foresight bought me a bottle of champagne before he left. I don't really drink all that much. Um, so the bottle's kind of been sitting in our fridge. I couldn't get the fucking cork out of the damn bottle. My hand was like red. Look at my hand. This is like red from trying to get the cork out of the champagne bottle. And it wouldn't budge. So I had to settle for stealing a couple of my husband's beers because um, because we're going to need it. I'm going to need it. You guys know this stuff very literally drives me uh, into madness. But we are going to watch together a webinar from the University of New Hampshire, a public funded university. And we are going to learn how we're all racist. Now, oh, Arn's here. Yay. Arn is one of my favorite people. Hi, Arn. Cheers. Happy Friday. Um, all right. So listen, part of the reason that we're going to be watching this webinar together today is that you all know, I mean, like, listen, you have to be like living under a rock to, to not know that I am fighting back against critical race theory in New Hampshire. We are really trying very hard to get um, uh, HB 544 passed uh, in the House, the Senate, and we're going to we're gonna get that governor of mine, that rhino governor of mine, to sign it, whether he likes it or not, um, if he wants any hope of getting that Senate seat that he really, really wants in the future. So, um, but one of the uh, roadblocks that we've been running into is people think that this stuff is not happening in New Hampshire. They really don't. They're like, this, this stuff happens other places not in new hampshire where we have like mountains and foliage and and all this stuff and we're nice and quaint and this stuff doesn't happen here but it does happen in new hampshire and so i've been asking people lately and this is a message i'm going to reiterate on this live stream if you know of these instances happening in new hampshire please get in touch with me please get in touch with me. My information is below. You can just go to drcarlin.com uh, and, and you can email me some stuff in. Um, and if you don't live in New Hampshire and this stuff is happening to you, you can you can contact me about that as well. I, got, I guess I got some info from, from like Disney before I came on the air. So you don't have to live in New Hampshire, but it, it is particularly relevant in New Hampshire right now. If you know anyone in New Hampshire, please ask them about this stuff. Please have them get in touch with me. If anything is happening that you know of, it's really, really important. This is not just about making fun of it on the internet. This is actually about, we're legislating here, people. This law is going to pass if it kills me. And it might just. Uh, so please, please, please make sure you send that in. And yes, at the same time, while you're there, Grandma says, smash that like button. I really appreciate it. You guys can uh, always support my work. One of the best ways is just by subscribing, hitting the notifications, leaving comments, giving it a thumbs up. Uh, doesn't require any money, but um, you know, if, you, if you're if you so inclined, you can also join my locals community, kb.locals.com. We already have some members of my community here in this chat. I see Adrian, I see Arn. So we've got a great community going on locals. If you want to come and join us, kb.locals.com. We don't have to worry about censorship or any other shenanigans. All right, everyone, let's Let's see what's what. Now, if I've done this correctly, you all should be able to hear the sound of this. I'm just going to do a quick check before I even go into what is on this page. I just want to do a quick tech check because I'm doing this on the fly and I want to make sure the sound is working. So I'm just going to play a few seconds of it and you guys let me know in the chat if the sound is working. Okay, ready. Second webinar that's part of our in-depth on inclusion series and we will be continuing the series. Do you guys hear the sound there? Please let me know if you heard the sound. Please let me know. Yes, yes. TM Schroeder says, yes, we can hear the sound. All right. So you can see 
This is on the University of New Hampshire website. In-depth on inclusion. Four steps to begin an anti-racist education. This is a webinar series sponsored by the University of New Hampshire with our taxpayer money. Four steps to being an anti to begin an anti-racist education from Kate Slater, 21. So graduating pretty soon. Associate Director, Institute for Recruitment of Teachers. And a lecturer, oh really, UNH, this is not happening in New Hampshire, you have got a lecturer uh, in a course called Teaching Race, University of New Hampshire, a white anti-racist scholar and educator. And that is what we are going to be watching. I have not, I have not watched any of this. I'm going to be reacting to this live for posterity and i want to know what you what you think uh please chat in anytime you have any thoughts about this webinar that we are about to watch all right let's see what new hampshire taxpayer money is funding in this webinar series throughout the fall and next year so we will continue to advertise and let you know about different topics that are coming up we are joined today by kate slater kate is a white anti-racist scholar and educator she's a doctoral candidate do you like how they have to enumerate like she's a white anti-racist scholar as opposed to being a non-white anti-racist scholar? Uh, we're in for a doozy, folks. I'll tell you what. In educational leadership and policy studies programs program here and a lecturer for the course Teaching Race, um, also here at UNH. Kate's article about how to support Black colleagues um, current, during the current situation was recently featured on the Today Show. This lecturer had an article about how to support black colleagues featured on the Today Show. As though as though the, the black people need the white people to to lecture to, about how to support them. I mean, that's <laughs> it's it's like we, we already have a we already know we have a white savior on our hands. The black people need our help. And she's oh, working on a podcast and is often asked to speak at regional and national educational program. And sometimes she's featured on YouTube channels. Just saying. We are honored that Kate is sharing her expertise with us today. We will definitely have time for question and answer later. Some people sent pre-questions, which is great. We will get to those as well. And we'll have a lot of resources. Okay. Side note, anytime you guys are in a webinar where they say like people sent in questions in advance, that's code for we were scared that we weren't going to get questions. And so we made them up. I have done so many webinars. There is, I have never done a single webinar where the pre-questions in advance were actually real. I'm just saying. With you in a follow-up email and let you know more about that at the end. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Kate. Thanks, Kate. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kate Slater. Hello, Kate. Hello, white lady. Um, let me just get to my notes because as nice as those slides were. Um, hello, so my name is Kate Slater and I am a white woman. No kidding. I, um, as Jen mentioned, I work at the Institute for Recruitment of Teachers. It's a nonprofit which um, supports social justice and racial equity in the educational sector. It supports students of color in pursuing their masters and doctorates with an eye towards entering into the educational sector. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate hopefully going to graduate this year. We'll see how that goes. But my dissertation um, centers the experiences of underrepresented minoritized students at predominantly white institutions. Um, and well, that explains why she's at the University of New Hampshire, doesn't it? Factors that contribute to their persistence um, in, their, in their undergraduate careers. And I'm also a lecturer for the course Teaching Race here at UNH. If anyone has like a syllabus or any information on that course, or maybe like, okay, this could be a fun project for people in the chat who want something useful to do while we're watching this one hour plus webinar. Does someone want to find the court, that course material online? This will be like a game. Whoever finds the course material for teaching race at the university of New Hampshire and emails it to me first, I'll give you like free merch or I'll give you like, you know, uh, like a, I will give you six months for free in my locals community. I will give you all sort I will give you all the prizes I can think of that are reasonable. Um, but that's going to be our, our group project for the duration of this live stream. I want the, the course materials for teaching. What was it? Teaching racism or whatever. I, you know, let me just rewind real quick a little bit. 
of underrepresented minoritized students at predominantly white institutions um, and factors that contribute to their persistence um, in their in their undergraduate yeah, careers. Okay, come on. And I'm also a lecturer for the course teaching race. Here. Teaching race at the University of New Hampshire. I want those course files. You all have your missions. Whoever does it first wins a prize. DrCarlin.com slash contact. You can email it to me below. Here at UNH. So there are other aspects to my identity. Um, my pronouns are she and hers. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. My pronouns are F and U. I'm a very slow runner. I'm a yogi. But the most important um, <laughs> aspect. Holy crap. Adrian has already found it. <laughs> Adrian has found it. Excellent. Adrian, you're my girl. Of my personality for per personality identity for purposes of this conversation is that I am a white woman. Um, and in this conversation, my name is Carlin Burisenko and I I am a white woman. <laughs> and, oh my god, I feel so gross and disgusting even saying that. Oh my god. I am speaking largely to other white people. Um, I'm speaking to white people who are interested in uh, taking on their own anti-racist education. That's my lane, that's my lens, that's my wheelhouse. Um, I do want to put out the big caveat that I'm in no way, shape or form an expert on the history of race and racism. Um, and actually I don't believe that it's possible for a white person <laughs> to be an expert in race and racism. Um, I don't think we can be an expert in something that we enact versus something that we experience. Guys, this is going to be a doozy of a webinar. This is going to be legit. We are in for like a legit Robin D'Angelo webinar today. You get like, if you listen, if you need a drink, you go get that drink. I have a wine glass with two beers in it. Okay. Go get that drink. Go do it. Um, so I want to give a little bit of context, um, to my background because I, I want to explain kind of how I came to anti-racist work and the scholarship that I do and the work that I do. So, um, I grew up in Maine, which as I'm sure many of you know, dukes it out with, uh, New Hampshire and Vermont as being one of the whitest states in, in the union. Um, yes, we are very white here in New Hampshire. We are. Um, I went to predominantly white schools my entire k-12 career i didn't have a single black teacher during my entire k-12 experience um i then went to a predominantly white institution where i had maybe a handful of professors that were people of color um i went and worked in predominantly white workspaces see and this is what you're going to find with these anti i'm going to do quotes anti-racist educators in that they typically tend to be exactly like kate here where they have no exposure to anyone that isn't white and because of that i'm sorry like a lot of them tend to harbor like actually really racist tendencies because all they they know about in people who are not white is what they've seen on tv and it's absolutely crazy like anytime you put someone in, in front of me like this i'm like that's a racist that's a racist right there and she she's she's convinced herself that this is just completely normal because i grew up in maine and i was socialized in this white environment and it's like no no it is not normal to see yourself as the savior of other races it's not and it is your own fault dude like you you chose to go to school in new hampshire you chose you literally chose the University of New Hampshire. Like why did you choose that if you th if you thought it was a problem that you weren't interacting with enough non-white people go somewhere else. It's not really that hard, dude. Like I grew up in Vermont. I went to school in Boston. I Boston is not all white people. Like there are a lot of non-white people I went to school with, particularly because I wanted to be around more diverse people. Like it's people like this that have never, like this is what Robin D'Angelo grew up with too. Robin D'Angelo, if you read her book, she literally talks about how she's a sheltered white lady. And she harbors all of this, like all of these biases because she was a sheltered white lady that never got out of her rich white shelter. Like get out there and actually meet people. Um. My entire Sorry, guys. I'm like really fired up today for some reason. Like I'm extra punchy, so I might be part of the problem in this webinar. We're gonna. Your life up in mid twenties was me being in predominantly white spaces, and in fact, it wasn't until my mid twenties that I had any kind of significant, substantial, lasting relationship with people of color. 
And I say that quite openly because I, I want to illustrate to all of you here how easy it was for me as a white person to go through the entirety of my life with predominantly white colleagues, friends, teachers, family members, roommates, and to never, first of all, know anything different or actively seek out anything different. That's your fault. It's your fault you didn't seek out anything different. It was so easy for me to insulate myself in a predominantly white space. Um, and then I came to my current job at the IRT. And for the first time in my life, I was the only white person in a room full of people of color. Um, and there was only so long and so many times that I could hear anecdotes from the students that I was supporting about racism that they had experienced both in their K-12 education and in their undergrad. Like what? Like what? And I'm not denying that racism exists. I'm not denying that at all. I, I absolutely do believe racism exists. I absolutely do believe she heard stories of real racism. But this is what they do all the time in these trainings is they speak in generalities. No, I am not taking a drink every time she says white. Marjorie, that's a horrible idea. Um, no, I mean, but this is what they do in these trainings is they speak in such broad generalities. They never get into specifics. So you don't know. You don't know if this is actually a legit problem. And again, I'm acknowledging there are absolutely legitimate questions to have about race. I've always said that. But these like white saviors, they prevent us from having those conversations. And they they and they and they flat out make stuff up. Listen, if you have not recently watched benjamin boyce's series on evergreen and, and i mean from like start to finish he's got like 23 videos now about in this series i've been re-watching it the last couple of days and this is what they do throughout that entire series anytime there's any anti-racist training and this was at evergreen state college which is the most woke of the woke right they spoke in generalities they never gave specifics and they would flat out lie and this is part of the problem this is why we can't have a reasonable conversation about this i bet you she's going to give no specifics Specifics, but we'll see. Before I began to realize, and this sounds incredibly ignorant to be in my mid 20s realizing this, but before I began to, began to realize that there was something deeply systemic to the anecdotes that I was hearing, that you can't, I can't explain away these kind of individual stories when you're hearing them over and over and over and day in and day out. Um, so I took it upon myself to really dive in to understanding the systems of racism that exist in all of the sectors of this country, but primarily in the educational sector. Again, that's my wheelhouse. Um, and so I enrolled in this doctoral program and I began to um, take quite seriously my own anti-racist education to understand, to understand the forces that I was coming up against and that the students that I supported were coming up against. I also recognize that my own anti-racist education she has given no specifics. I just want to acknowledge that she has given no specifics. Let's see. Every time I will, I will play this drinking game. Every, I will drink every time she gets gives actual specifics in this webinar, and I will drink in between that too. Because if I was only waiting for her to give specifics, I wouldn't be drinking at all in this webinar, and I will not survive this webinar if I don't have a drink. Okay, all right. Is never done. <laughs> It, this is this is always going to be a work in progress because I am a white person. Therefore, I represent whiteness. Therefore, I represent oppression. Um, I am a white person. Therefore, I represent whiteness. Therefore, I represent oppression. Uh -huh. Historically in this country and worldwide. And so one of the first things that I realized when I kind of started digging into this work is that, that I was never going to achieve kind of this <laughs> oppression shot. <laughs> Sadly, I do not have any liquor in the house right this second. Sorry. Oh shit. Here we go. Ultimate level of like anti-racist varsity level. And I don't mean to say that to sound flippant, but that's a really challenging thing to reckon with at first, I think, to really say, okay, this is going to be a lifetime endeavor. And it's actually going to be a lifetime endeavor where I'm probably going to screw up. 
So this is one of the things that you guys need to know about the anti-racist training industry is that this is what they say. They can never cure you of your whiteness. You will always be an oppressor your entire life. The very best that you can do is to come and continue to do the anti-racist work. You, it is a lifelong process to do the work and to pay us hundreds of thousands of dollars while you do the work. Like, this woman is probably going to make a lot of money over the course of her lifetime, unless we manage to defeat all this. She's going to make a lot of money over the course of her lifetime teaching white people that they are racist, teaching white people that they are oppressors, teaching white people that they will never be anything other than racist oppressors. She, she, she literally just said that, like, this is a lifetime and I'm going to screw up. Like, again and again and again. And so when you say that, when you say, okay, this this is something I'm going to engage in for a lifetime. I recognize I will never get to a space where I'm good enough. And I reckon I will never get to a space where I am good enough. Can I can we just talk for a second about how harmful that thought is? Listen, like here, here's what I want everyone listening right now to know. You are enough just the way you are. You don't need to do anything to be enough. You don't need to, to, you know, to, to work against your inherent whiteness to be enough. You are fine just the way you are. And if we were teaching people that they were enough just the way they are, the world would be a much better place. It's people like these that, that screw people up. The idea that I will never be enough if I don't keep doing anti-racist training my entire life. I will never be enough. That is so emotionally harmful. I cannot even tell you. I said I'm going to fail, not just once, but continuously. That's a really challenging undertaking, right? But it's also, in many ways, I think... And I don't mean this to sound flippant, it's freeing in a way. Um, there is so much pressure, I think, that we as white people put on ourselves um, in our. There is so much pressure that we as white people put on ourselves as though all white people do everything the same way. Not all white people have the same worldview. Not all black people have the same worldview. Not all Latino people have the same worldview. Not all Native American. Like it, it is so, it is so condescending to say you are only your race, what you do, how you see the world, how you contribute, how you see yourself, how you view other people, entirely dependent on the skin color with which you were born. Our own anti-racist endeavors to get it right and get it perfect. And in fact, the fear of, of um, getting it wrong often uh, forestalls us from actually taking any kind of action whatsoever. And so with that in mind, if you say, I recognize that I'm going to fail in this and I know what I need to do is then educate myself and do better the next time again and again and again, it makes it easy to make that a lifetime practice in many ways. So in this conversation, I'm going to talk about anti- This woman is going to age prematurely. Mark my words. Mark my words. Captain Underpants and Dogman, thank you for the super sticker. I appreciate it. Racism, what it means and how to practically engage in it as, as a lifetime practice. And I just skipped all the way to the questions, which was not what I wanted to do. So first I just- Guys, we haven't even started the webinar yet. We haven't even started being educated yet. I just want to clarify some terms for everyone. Racism. This is a word I'm gonna say a lot over the next hour. So if this is something where you get like a little rubber band snap every time I say it, get used to it. I refer to racism drink to myself as being racist in that I have a racist worldview. She just said, I refer to myself as being racist in that I have a racist world view. Congratulations, folks. We are listening to an admitted racist sponsored by the University of New Hampshire. I live in a world that's shaped by race, as all of us do. I have absorbed messaging about race and racism my entire life, whether it was conscious or unconscious. I've absorbed that messaging from my parents. She just said her parents were racist. 
from my friends, from my classmates, from my teachers. Her parents, her friends, her classmates, her teachers, all racist. And so when I say I am racist, I am saying I have a racist worldview. And this is not about morality. It simply acknowledges that my world and the knowledge that I have is socially constructed and race is a social fact in this world that has very real determinants, um, excuse me, that very, that has uh, very real outcomes um, and determines the way that people move through this world. She literally just called everyone in her life a racist. I'm sure her parents are very proud. So Robin D'Angelo writes, um, oh, and she's the author of White Drake. Fragility. One of the most important white pillars is what I call the good bad binary. The idea that you're either racist or you're not. If you're racist, you're bad. You're intentionally and consciously mean to people. See, and here is where their entire argument falls apart because they will call out people for being racist all day, every day as though it's bad. And then they do this thing where they're like, we don't really mean you're a bad person if we call you a racist. In fact, we're going to call ourselves racist. This is how you know that we don't think you're a bad person because we we admit ourselves that we are racist. And if you're not racist, you're good, you're nice, you're open-minded, you're liberal, you're all those things that we want to think we are. What that sets up is that being a good person and being complicit with racism become mutually exclusive. And... Becoming complicit with racism is unfortunately something that we as white people just are. Being complicit with racism is something that we as white people just are. All white people are racist in the land of D'Angelo. So Ibram Kendi actually just writes that instead of thinking... Guys, we need to we need to create an anti-racist bingo card. Like I I'm going to start reacting to more of these trainings publicly. It's been on the list for a while. We need to create an anti-racist bingo card every time we do one of these trainings and like whoever gets bingo first or like blackout first gets a prize or something. Our our dress uh you will probably fail. God help you if you have a paralyzing phobia of failure which can cause you to spiral into a clinical depression. Dude, they want people depressed. They want people to hate themselves. I don't know what other conclusions we can draw other than they literally want white people to hate themselves. As racism, instead of thinking of racism as a bad term and therefore a sign that if we have a racist worldview, we are bad people, it, it removes well, the kind of... Hang on. I want to say something about this. So I was actually just talking about this on Jack Murphy's channel um, earlier. But listen, we've talked about the teacher education training that I sat in on a couple months ago where they're literally teaching teachers when they're working with biracial students to tell them to identify with the non-white part of themselves, not the white part of themselves, because the white part of themselves is the oppressor. So they're supposed to identify with the non-white parent and the non-white part of themselves more. Description of what it simply is. I am racist. I have a worldview that is shaped by race. So I also want to talk a little bit about white supremacy, because I think that's a term that's very loaded for a lot of people. When you think of white supremacy, you think of, you know, people in white hoods riding out and lynching people in Jim Crow era South. It's a very weighted term. But I refer a lot to systems of white supremacy. And when I say white supremacy, I don't mean these kind of um, these, these particular very uh, extreme triggering examples. I mean simply a worldview that I have been indoctrinated in that sets whiteness as both the default and the ideal. No one is setting whiteness as the ideal except for the anti-racist people. I would never say that whiteness is the ideal. I would never say that whiteness is the default. Like, how many of you would say that it's a, like, these people are literally the white supremacists. They're the ones that are saying whiteness is the ideal. Well, no, it's not. That's racist. So, I mean, this is, this is why I say like all of these people, like all of these like white progressives, anti-racist people, they are some of the more racist people you will ever meet because they are actually the first ones to say being white is the ideal. That is something literal white supremacists say. Normal people don't say that. So let me say it again. When I say I have a white supremacist worldview or I am subscribing to white supremacy, 
I am talking about a worldview that sets whiteness as the default and the ideal. Whiteness is not the default or the ideal. Just because you grew up in Maine does not mean that being white is the default or the ideal. And I'm going to use a really quick anecdote to illustrate a worldview that is both racist and white supremacist, because I really oh, want to show how those terms that can feel very extreme for many of us actually show up in these, these very kind of subtle, mundane, everyday ways. So I work at the IRT. It's located um, in Andover. And part of our programming is that we have a summer workshop where we invite um, scholars of color to come be in residence on the Andover campus. Now, these scholars are 22 and 23 years old. They're adults. Um, and so as part of the programming on the weekend, they are left alone to do what they want. The past few years, we have actually set very stringent rules on our students. And we have said that on Saturday nights and Friday nights, you can do what you want, but you cannot travel outside the bounds of Andover for safety purposes. They're telling their students that they can't leave town. That doesn't sound authoritarian at all. Now, Lawrence is a town that's right next door to Andover. Lawrence has a very large population of... Wait, 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 wait. Okay. She's not wrong. Like, I, I live not too far away from where they are. Like, she's not wrong that Lawrence has, like, a very large population of color. But does anyone else find it to be a little racist that this... This organization, whatever it is, is telling students that they can't leave town on Friday and Saturday night because for their for their safety. And then at the same time, saying the town one town over is like primarily a, like a large population of people of color. That's racist. People of color. For many of our students who are almost all people of color, their inclination might be to go to a space like Lawrence. But we at the IRT, I, I'll implicate myself in this, set this bizarre arbitrary rule that simply said for safety purposes, we want people to stay inside the confines of Andover, which is a predominantly white town. You can't, dude, this is, inc this is, these people are so racist. These are adults. Let them go where they want. Follow up to that. When a former colleague who is a woman of color accepted a position at the IRT, she was talking to a woman in human resources about where she might want to live in the area. And the woman said to her, quite blatantly, a woman of color, yeah, I would steer clear of Lawrence. That's really a place you don't want to be. So I use those two examples to illustrate. Listen, I don't know what the crime rate is in Lawrence, but I don't think it's good. And I don't think like, it, I mean, it's like that, that sort of area. And it's not, I don't, I wouldn't ascribe that to race. I would subscribe that to like the working class nature of that particular area. It's a lower income area. That's the way it is. But this is like, all right, like the, these are people working in your organization. It is your organization that is racist. Both a racist view and a white supremacist worldview. In both of those examples, there was the assumption that Lawrence being predominantly people of color is somehow less safe. That's not the, that's not because they're predominantly people of color. It's because it's fact. Lawrence is not the safest place in the world. Lowell is not the safest place in the world. Safe, sketchy, using these racially coded languages, um, sketchy, um, not great, not a great space to live in. So that's a racist worldview, right? There are assumptions about the town based on the racial makeup. No, 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 no. You're making assumptions about the town, about why the towns are less safe. I would, it would have never, dude, I live like half an hour away from there. Like it would never like, and I've been there many times and it, usually I feel perfectly fine. I'm not going there at night by myself. That's stupid because it has like a higher crime rate. Okay. And then there's also the white supremacist worldview. There is the assumption that the ideal in this case would be a town like Andover, which is predominantly white. Andover is bougie as hell. It's bougie. Thank you. Thank you for the chat. There it's white people who have come in and gentrified the town. For all of the things that come with it, a particular socioeconomic status, a particular level of safety, never, of course, occurring to me or this woman in HR 
that perhaps most of the people of color that were students at the IRT or my former colleague might actually have been way more comfortable in an environment like Lawrence versus a predominantly white space where they felt unfairly targeted. Then why did you implement a stupid rule saying they couldn't leave town? Like all of this could have been avoided by you and your organization not implementing a stupid, arbitrary, authoritarian rule telling adult students, I'm assuming they're adults, they might not be, but I'm assuming, that they couldn't leave town on Friday and Saturday. That is the stupidest rule I ever heard. Dude, I went to school in the middle of Boston, and no one, like, and there are areas in Boston that are not necessarily the safest place in the world. Boston never implemented a rule saying don't leave campus on Friday and Saturday nights. It is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You are the one being an authoritarian and a racist in this example or singled out, or they were kind of hyper aware of, of their own racial identity in these spaces. So I use that because that's an anecdote that I'm sure many of us have either had similar conversations to or actively said ourselves, but it shows these kind of covert ways, these kind of insidious ways that a racist view point or a white supremacist viewpoint enter into our daily lexicon and we perpetuate it, right? I'm sure if you had a conversation like this in the past, you've never thought about it in these particular terms. But I'm saying it to simply show how often we perpetuate racist or white supremacist messaging without even being aware of it. In the course of the last five minutes, she is literally the racist in this conversation. And yet we're watching a webinar sponsored by the University of New Hampshire, paid for by your taxpayer dollars or my taxpayer dollars anyway, um, because I actually live here. Like, and we're supposed to listen to her about how not to be racist when she just told us a story showing that she's the racist. Okay. Yeah, Charmed 3XS. Hang on, Charmed. I saw it. Hang on. Oh, there it is. No, Carlin, you're a racist since you don't want to go to a crime area at night. I'm smart for not wanting to go there at night. <laughs> okay. So a lot of acts of racism and white supremacy are not these overt horrific acts. They're not often the intentional acts of evil people. They're covert acts. And they happen every day when our biases... Are we supposed to not acknowledge that some areas have higher crime rates than others and some areas are simply safer for people in general to go than others? Are we just supposed to not acknowledge that now? These and our prejudices as white people come out in these particular ways. So anti-racism, by contrast, fights against racist. If this woman has not walked down the street in Lawrence in the middle of the night, then I'm going to call her a racist and white supremacist worldviews. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what anti-racism means just a little bit later. I also wanna clarify something else. So I very intentionally use language around racism, white supremacy, and anti-racism. I also wanna clarify that in this conversation, I'm gonna use the language of freedom very specifically. Really? <laughs> It was actually pointed out to me only three weeks ago that in all my time as an anti-racist scholar and an anti-racist educator and an educator in general, I had never used the word liberation <laughs> to describe the ultimate end goal of my own anti-racist endeavors. There are so many terms out there that we kind of dance around. Equity, multiculturalism, tolerance, cultural competency. I'm still waiting for freedom. I'm still waiting for it. And every one of these terms are very powerful in their own right. But for me, they are less than the ultimate goal. If you are engaged in anti-racist endeavors, if you are an anti-racist. Okay, everyone needs to hang on to their hats because we're about to hear something that's like one of the most Orwellian things that any of us have ever heard. You ready for it? The ultimate goal is the liberation from a for black and brown people in this country. Okay, that's not what I thought she was going to say. I thought that she was going to say the ultimate goal of anti-racist education is freedom. <laughs> but no, the liberation of black and brown people in this country. All right, fine. And that means it is not about, it's not about your own edification. It's, it's freedom for thee, but not for me. It's not about your own um, 
journey through anti-racism. It's actually not about you. And if for a minute you lose sight that that's what the ultimate goal is, that all of these things you're engaging in is so you can slowly move the needle towards liberation, then you're losing sight of the endeavor. So I'm going to use language. Liberation from what? From oppression, probably. Of liberation and freedom and oppression and oppressor. Because I don't want a single person on this webinar to forget for a single minute that that is the ultimate goal of anti-racist work. I also want to take a quick moment to... <laughs> Monica, on my way to tell my husband he needs a white girl from New Hampshire to liberate him. <laughs> well, you come to the right place. For lack of a better way, I, I, I'm going to mess up in saying this, but just acknowledge the moment we're in and acknowledge that for many of you on this webinar, the idea of anti-racism might be a very new idea for you. The idea of what engaging in anti-racist work may be very new for you. And I want to acknowledge that this might be a painful moment. You might have woken up 45 days ago after the murder of George Floyd and all of a sudden realize that not only racism is alive and well in this country, but actually you as a white person are complicit in it in ways that you may not have ever. So this is the part where they're priming you to be more receptive. This is a little trick that trainers use. Like what we're we, what we what we talk about today may be uncomfortable. You may feel uncomfortable hearing this information. And that's when you need to tell yourself to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And I know that because I use that trick in my training. But when I use it, I'm not trying to brainwash people into a fundamentally racist ideology. I'm getting them to try to communicate with people they disagree with. It is a fundamentally different thing, but it's a trick nonetheless to get people to when they're getting used to a new idea to let the idea marinate a little bit more. And you can use the trick for good. You can use the trick for evil. She's using it for fundamentally evil purposes. Or even conceptualized. That's painful, right? It's painful to be engaged in this work and be looking back over your life and just thinking, oh my God, how much harm have I done? And going through the process right now of reckoning with your white privilege, the shame and the guilt and the anger and the sadness that come out of that, it's, it's a lot. And you might be feeling whiplash, the feeling that you're not doing enough um, towards anti-racist work. You're doing too much. You you are so burned out from watching podcasts and webinars and listening to um she's gonna cry she's gonna cry she's gonna cry before the end of this webinar mark my words presentations that you don't know where to turn and these feelings are completely valid and i i, I really oh want to say that God. they are normal they are a part of waking up to systems of oppression and racism and it's a sign that you're dialed in unfortunately what is, what is, oh God, what is the name of the term where like the syndrome where people who are kidnapped start to identify with their kidnappers? What is that term? This is what these people are priming you for. Fortunately, these feelings are a reality of anti-racist work, of being an anti-racist discomfort and Stockholm syndrome. Thank you. I knew it started with an S. I couldn't. It was like right on the tip of my tongue. Shame and guilt and the push and pull between I'm not doing enough and I'm doing too much. Very, very, very much a part of this work. Um, so this, these feelings are probably going to be your reality for a while. Um, they're a sign that you're waking up um, and it's uncomfortable and it's probably never going to go back to normal. Negative feelings of guilt and anxiety are not a sign that you're waking up and becoming conscious of your inherent racism. They are a sign. So they are your body telling you that something is wrong. Most of the time, when we feel uncomfortable with something, it is because our body is telling us that it does not pass the sniff test. That it is wrong. And what these people are trying to get you to do. Yes, exactly, exactly. This is cult grooming language. That is exactly what this is. They're trying to groom you to get you to join their little anti-racist cult. And you notice she does this at the beginning of the web. Guys, we are 20 minutes into this and she hasn't even started 
the webinar yet. She hasn't even started the education portion of the webinar because what they do is they need to prime you for it because they know that if you don't know anything going into this, that the stuff that they're going to talk about is going to make you feel uncomfortable. And so they have to do all of these different qualifications before we ever get started. What she's doing right now is she's meeting objections before she's trying to answer to objections before she even gets into the education portion of the webinar so that when she gets into it and people are like, that doesn't make sense. That kind of sounds kind of racist. She can go, remember what I said at the beginning. Remember, I told you this was going to make you feel uncomfortable. And it was going to be a lifelong process of you doing the work and educating yourself to get over those feelings of discomfort. And you might never get over those feelings of discomfort. There are reasons that you feel uncomfortable and it has nothing to do with you grappling with your inherent racism. Which is hard, right? Because we want these feelings to go away. I, you know, I want to stop feeling angry. I want to stop crying because the moment we're in right now, this racial uprising feels so painful. It feels so long coming as a, as a scholar of history, as someone who uses the historical lens to describe the moment we're in. It is so long coming, but it makes it no less painful. Dude, if you're crying all day, every day because of your inherent racism, there is a larger problem. Um, but these feelings aren't going to go away, right? There's that old adage, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. So the question, therefore, is how to be an anti-racist sustainably. We're in a movement right now, not a moment. And I, I, I think we're in a moment that is becoming a movement. But if the movement is going to continue, it is dependent on the sustained anti-racist endeavors of white people. Yes, it is very, I, on this point, we agree. It is white people that will continue to drive the anti-racist movement. On this, we absolutely agree. It is white saviors like this person who will continue to drive the anti-racist movement. And guess what, guys? They're going to make a boat ton of money doing it. They're going to cash in every single time they do one of these trainings. I wonder how much she got paid for this training. I should, I should like, I should, I should try to get those records from UNH because I think I can do that. They're a public institution. Which means that we as white anti-racists have to find a balance amidst all these feelings, because if we burn out, we are, we're no good. We're no. I mean, maybe best case scenario is that all of the anti-racist white saviors do burn themselves out. Maybe that is actually our best case scenario. They break themselves in the process and they have to go into like, uh, anti they have to go into like anti-racist rehab and like some sort of beach resort where they just sit around all day talking about their inherent racism, but they don't bother us anymore. That might be like actually the best case scenario. No good to the movement if we take on this to a level where we can't sustain the work we're doing. And I've been really challenged by this, to be quite frank. I mean, I've been studying kind of systems of white supremacy for a very long time. And I woke up 45 days ago and all of a sudden I have found um, myself engaged in this work to a level that I never anticipated. Wait, 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 wait. Did she just say that it took the death of a black man to get her really engaged with work that she had been doing for years? I think she did. She did. And I go to sleep at night thinking about racism. And I wake up in the morning thinking about racism. And it's a lot. And I don't have the answer. She's almost crying. We're almost there. It's only 20 minutes into the webinar. I, I don't. And I wish I did. Um, but I haven't figured it out. I simply say that to say that that tension is something that we have to learn to live with. And we have to learn how to be engaged in this work in the way that we need to be. But we also have to know how to take breaks from that work and step back so we can come back to the work renewed. If you take breaks from the work, you are a racist. That is a racist action to take a break. What are you talking about? Guys, if you feel like a break, hit that thumbs up button, please. Thank you. Thumbs up. Smash that like button. There is no way, <laughs> I'll, I'll throw myself out on this. There is no way I am going to be able to keep up the pace that I've been at for the past 45 days. There is no way. Um, I, I just can't. I, I cannot live the rest of my life only listening to sources about racism and talking about it with my family members. Dude, 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 dude. As someone who has done my fair share of corporate training, let me give you a little advice. Your preamble to the training that you're doing should not include, I just can't do this work any longer. It's killing me. 
That is not something your audience needs to know. Your audience doesn't need to know that you're burning yourself out. Your audience doesn't need to know how crazy you are. That is not helpful to teaching them anything. I mean, I'm thankful she's doing it because she's laying her cards on the table like an idiot right up front. But like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I never went into a training. and was like, let me tell you, this training, it just takes a lot out of me. It takes everything I have to get up and do. And by the way, like anytime you're doing corporate training, you're making a lot of money. Like if you're doing your job while well, you're making like a lot of money. And so to go in and be like, this is just taking everything I have. I can't do it anymore while you're paying me thousands of dollars to do this. Cry yourself to sleep over a martini later after the training. You don't do that in the, in the preamble. And talking to my friends about it. I have to know how to take a break. And so, again, I don't have answers to how to manage this tension, but I want to acknowledge that the tension exists and it's something that we all have to kind of sit in. At the same time, we can acknowledge the enormous privilege of being able to step back from anti-racist engagement. Oh my God! What she's saying, what she's about to say is that we as white people, have the privilege of stepping away from this work. We have the privilege of taking a break, whereas people of color do not have that privilege. They can never step away from racism. Engagement from anti-racist work, right? You know, I saw a post recently that just said simply how privileged it is to get to study racism as opposed to experiencing it. And that's real, right? And I think that something that is kind of inherent in anti-racist work is that two things that are opposing can be true at the same time. They can be in dialectics. Um, and I don't have an answer to that. Like we can simultaneously recognize the need for us to do anti-racist work sustainably while also acknowledging the extreme privilege of us being able to make that choice. Oh my God. I'm listening says anyone who goes to sleep and wakes up with racism on their mind is simply assuaging their own guilty conscience. That is correct. I agree. But I did just want to take a time, a, a little moment to acknowledge that and to acknowledge all of your feelings. Your little moment has gone on for 22 minutes and 30 seconds. And what I'm going to do, hopefully, is talk a little bit more about what sustainable anti-racist work looks like. So what is anti-racism? <laughs> I've said this term. I've thrown it around. I mean, if you had a bingo card, you probably... <laughs> for a bingo card we need a bingo card dude i will pay someone if you if you develop a really cool bingo card i will give you a prize i will make some sort of, i don't know how much but like i will definitely give you a prize of some sort I have one about 10 minutes ago um what is anti-racism so anti-racism is in direct opposition to racism basically essentially the premise is you can't be not racist in this society you cannot be not racist. When they say systemic racism, what they mean, guys, is racism exists everywhere. It exists everywhere in every person and in every institution. And our job as critical theorists, which is where critical race theory comes from, is to be critical over every single thing in every institution, every interaction, and to suss out the racism. The question is not if racism exists. The question is how did racism manifest itself in this situation? You either have a racist worldview and whether or not you're aware of it, you are living out your life enacting covert or overt acts of racism. You're doing harm, whether or not you're aware of it, or you are actively anti-racist. You are either doing harm to people of color or you are being actively anti-racist. But even if you're actively anti-racist like this white savior lady, you are still a lifelong racist because you are white. You're racist either way. You're racist either way. You might as not you might as well not like buy into a soul-sucking ideology. If you're gonna be racist either way, what does it matter? So Angela Davis says, in a racist society, which we are in, it is not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. And so for many of you, do you guys notice how they present they they present this as just fact? Like we are we we are in a racist society. Fact. Fact. That's not a fact. That's not true. 
you, that means that you are realizing that maybe some of the old adages that you have been clinging to as a sign that you are a good person are not. Yeah, actually, Effie says, and this is a really good point. Notice her blinking away the lies. It's a common tell. Guys, if you want to know when someone's blink like lying, like look for the blinks because the blinks will often be an indication that they're not telling the truth and that they know they're not telling the truth. Alexander DeJohn says, my ears are bleeding. I've dealt with this topic, a lot of this topic today. I actually emailed you on the site about that today. I'm so over it. Alexander, I knew I recognized your name when I got that email. I was like, where do I know this name from? Now I know. I did get your email. I did see it. Thank you for that. Enough. These kind of adages, I don't see color. I was raised to treat everyone fairly. Everyone has an equal opportunity in this country. You are realizing that not only are those false, but they are a sign that you are not doing enough work. No, it is not actually false that I was raised to treat everyone the same. That is not false. And it is also not a sign that I'm not doing enough anti-racist work. I fundamentally do not buy into the premise. And this is what you have to do. Every time these people say something crazy, because they just do this over and over again, they make statements as though it's fact. Like, just because you were told to treat people equally growing up doesn't mean that you're an, an anti-racist. Like, you have to call them out and say, no. Like, I don't need to do your stupid made up fringe ideology. So to quote another very famous um, anti-racist, Desmond Tutu, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So for me, anti-racism anti is actively combating my own race. I don't think any of us are neutral to injustice. We just don't buy into your crazy ideology. There is a difference between those two things. This worldview, as well as other racist acts to uplift people who are oppressed. So how does one actually become anti-racist or dive into this work? Um, especially if, again, you woke up 45 days ago and realized how much you had to learn and that you needed to do better. How does one become an anti-racist? How does one do that work? So forgive me if this is trite, but I really like, I like mnemonics and things like that. So I came up at 5.45 in the morning when I was lying awake thinking about racism. The five, I came up with the four S's of anti-racist education. And they're, so they're four simple steps, not simple actually, did she just say that she just came up with the basis of this presentation at five in the morning? Okay. Okay. The opposite of simple, but they're simple to remember. Four steps that you can take to begin your anti-racist education. So the first S stands for show up. And this means physically, mentally, and emotionally. So the very thrust of the book, White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo, is that white people have a really tough time handling their feelings about racism. No, no. I feel just fine about my feelings about racism. I feel peachy keen about my feelings about racism because I'm not a racist. And when they are confronted with an understanding of their own racist worldview, uh, the number of responses that they have range from def defensiveness to emotional fragility where they shut down if you don't if you are white and you don't admit that you are a racist you are just being defensive that is your white fragility showing i cry to wanting to withdraw from the world to um pretending that they didn't hear this at all um it's a huge range of responses to be i wonder where i fall on the range of response when i just get on the internet and do a whole entire youtube live stream about how this woman's a racist i wonder where that falls on the impression hierarchy being confronted with our own racist worldview. And I think especially now in a moment of racial revolution, it would be very easy for many white people to just be like, this is, this is too much. I'm withdrawing. I'm not. No, what we're doing is saying this is stupid and we don't agree with you. Reading anything else. Um, but at the panel a few weeks ago, Julian Maduro spoke about this and she said, um, it's not our burden, and she means people of color. It's not our burden alone to know the racist things that happen. Take yourself out of that nameless crowd. Become actively anti-racist. That's the only way to make change. 
Well, okay, so hang on, hang on. Hang on. Someone said I was getting canceled from YouTube. Brother Tree One says, Careful, Carl, you might get canceled from YouTube. Dude, this is all the more reason to join my locals. I have several local members here in the chat. They can tell you how awesome my locals is. I will put the link to my locals in the chat. Because if I ever do get canceled from YouTube, you can always find me on locals. So when I show up, I mean, you need to work through those feelings and show up again and again and again, which means you need to fight the natural instinct to withdraw because you're super scared of making a mistake. Be present in this moment. Do not lean away from this moment. The deaths of black and brown individuals over the past few weeks, not to- Black and brown individuals are counting on you to admit your inherent racism as a racist white lady. Mentioned for 400 years in this country's history, the deaths as a result of deep systemic oppression and racism is painful to reckon with. It is painful to reckon as white people with our complicity in those deaths, our complicity in the systems that made those deaths possible. Do not lean away from that. Do not withdraw from that. It is our responsibility as white people to bear witness. Look at the furrowed brow, guys. Guys, look at the furrowed brow. This is like, I am going to be very disappointed in you. If you do not admit your inherent racism, mother will be mad at you. <laughs> to what is happening and to show up again and again and again. So if that means physically, that means you are going to rallies. It means you are attending the webinars. It means you are going to the lectures. Mentally, it means that you are dialed in. Dialed in. It means that you are taking these things in. You are thinking about them. You are mulling over these concepts. You are having the conversations with your family members. And May is the last one. Show up emotionally. I just finished talking about all of the incredibly painful and uncomfortable feelings that have come up. Well, actually, guys, we are showing up and doing the work. Congratulations to us. We are not racist anymore. We are showing up and doing the work. We are watching this webinar. We are here. We are paying attention. We are thinking about the concepts that she's articulating. We have all done our work for today. Congratulations. You are no longer racist. For me, certainly over the past 45 days. And honestly, quite frankly, for much, much, much longer. But you have to show up and, and bear witness to that emotion, right? You have to make space for that emotion because if you do not feel it, it's a sign you're withdrawing from anti-racist work. So show up physically, mentally, and emotionally. The second S is shut up and listen. And that oh, means decenter yourself. My God. White people need to sit back and shut up right now. This is what happened to me. This is what happened to me when all of my friends went crazy. All of a sudden, one day, all at the same time, they just started saying, Carlin, shut up and listen to black people. I was like, what are you talking about? And that's very hard, right? In many ways, because if we are just kind of waking up to our own- Yeah, says the girl running the webinar. Exactly, Monica. Like the white lady, the, the white racist lady who denied black and brown people going into the black and brown community right next door to them is telling people on the webinar to shut up as she's running the webinar. Exactly. Whiteness, there's kind of this inherent need to talk that out or process it or say where we are or talk about all of these things. Um, it is not our time right now to be centering our own anti-racist endeavors. Any, any the guys, irony is that people- Listen, like guys, just as a general rule, if anyone is ever telling you to shut up, to not express yourself, you have to stop listening to that person immediately. Expression is a gift that we have all been given from God purely by the virtue of being here. Anyone who tells you to shut up in any circumstance is not someone that is worth being listened to. And I'm guilty or I'm listening. Thank you for that super chat. I appreciate it. Of color, black people and people of color have been talking about their lived experience as long as there have been oral histories, 400 years, certainly at least um, in this country's history. And so if you all of a sudden just woke up and realized that black scholars and activists are on Instagram and are saying the things that you have not been hearing up. You need to go on Instagram and listen to black, shut up and go on Instagram and listen to black scholars. Until now, you need to make space for their voices. 
validate and recognize the lived experiences of Black people and people of color as salient, relevant, and important. You know, I had a conversation with a leftist earlier today, and he like live streamed it to YouTube. So I'm sure, or not YouTube, to uh, uh, LinkedIn, which I'm sure I'm going to be getting a, a mountain ton of crap for. But he was talking about this. He was like, you know, leftists, we understand how to shut up and listen to the experiences of black and brown people. We understand empathy. We understand listening to those experiences. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? Because I remember when Walk Away did that rally in Chicago, and the vast majority of our speakers were black and we were protested by black lives matter who were almost entirely white and they were literally standing there beating drums and having all sorts of noisemakers to literally drown out the voices of the black speakers at our rally so when they say shut up and listen to black people they never mean all black people they only mean black people that agree with them when it comes to black people who disagree with them like my friend shamika michelle like, they don't want her talking. They don't want to listen to her. They have actively tried to d- drown out her voices. I've seen it happen so many times. Like, people like Shamika Michelle are incredibly dangerous to people like this because they are Black people who are not towing this line. And they are saying, like, you guys are really the racist in this scenario. And guys, if you don't follow Shamika, follow Shamika. Shamika's awesome. She's the best. Your own opinions right now, as white people, do not matter, quite frankly. You have not. The opinions of white people do not matter. Your opinions do not matter. Then why are you giving the webinar? Why is it that anti racist trainers are always white, except for Ibram X. Kendi? Like, why is it these white anti racist training people that are always like, your voice, your opinions don't matter, but ours do? We're literally giving the webinar. The Legion of Reason says subjective interpretations of live experience are not evidence for objective claims. Well, here's where I'm going to give my little lecture, guys. Like, I actually have my entire dissertation is based on lived experiences, right? But there is actually a way to measure and analyze lived experiences that do, that do make it a really scientific process. It's an extremely labor intensive process. And one of the things that really pisses me off, I spent like years working on my dissertation to be able to do this. These people ruin that course of study. There is very valid reasons you want to do a qualitative form of inquiry. But like when they take lived experiences, they've changed the term so that it becomes pretty much meaningless. That's one of the people that reasons they piss me off. What's painful are those earrings. I don't disagree, Alexander. Experienced racism. You represent the oppressor. So do not for one hot minute think that your voice or your journey or your story outweighs the experience of people who have actually experienced racism. Do not presume you know better. Do not presume even that you know different. Um, That's a tough one, right? Because it is coming from a place for many of us of good intentions, but it's not about your good intent and it's not about your questions. Just because you woke up and all of a sudden you're ready to do the work doesn't mean that Black people are now your personal therapist, your personal Google, any of the above. A former. Why would you ever treat Black people like they're your own personal Google? Why would you do that, racist white lady? A colleague of mine did an Instagram post the other day and he was like, welcome to the party. I'm glad you're here. The party's been going on for a long time, right? So it's not our job to to borrow that metaphor, to show up and talk about how great the party is, right? We've been missing the boat for a very long time as white people. So just show up and dig in and stop making it about ourselves. There is an app that exists called Your Black Friends Are Busy. Check it out. It is a comprehensive list of resources that if you... If anyone wants to download that app and tell me what's on that app, that would be great. But don't feel obligated because I don't want that shit on my phone. If you want to know more about the history of race and racism in this country, you can read. It centers the voice of people of color and Black people. So shut up and listen. Listen to those voices that have been telling you all of the information you need to know. The third S is support. And that means financial, probably one of the biggest, but also emotional and mental. So there is a huge racial wealth gap in this country. The uh, median income for a black family is a tenth, a tenth of the median income for a white family in this country. 
So what does she want us to do about, like, does she want us to just give black people money willy-nilly? I mean, honestly, and I'm actually not, okay, I know this is not, this is this is one of my controversial opinions that a lot of you guys don't agree with. I am actually not um, completely opposed to reparations if, 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 if they are done in a way that makes investments into things that are going to lift up underprivileged communities for the long term. I actually think that Trump missed a really big boat by not labeling his platinum plan as reparations because frankly, it was like a branding exercise. I'm not in favor of direct cash payments, but if we make investments into things that are long-term going to benefit underserved communities, I'm actually totally on board with that. And I think you can label them reparations, but like, what else do you want people to do? Like, I know there are these Facebook groups where literally it's like, it's like white people who feel guilty like this, like just giving money to black people. Like they, they said, like, I need to make rent. And like the white person's like, here, have my money. Like, is that the solution to racism? Okay, so I paid someone's rent for the month. Have we fixed racism yet? And that is because of slavery. It is because uh, Black people and people of color spent much of our country's history as cogs in the wheel of our own white economic gain. This person grew up in Maine where there was never slavery. And so how do you interrupt that? How do you how do you make amends for that? So one of the biggest things that you can do is if you have the means, be financially supportive. Set up a monthly recurring donation. That is not a hard thing to do. Set up a monthly recurring donation to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, the Loveland Foundation is an unbelievable nonprofit started by... Um, scholar Rachel Cargill that provides you know I mean the irony the irony here is like I'm actually not opposed to making donations to causes you believe in I'm not at all but like how many people are going to be turned off from donating to these causes specifically because a racist white lady told them to mental health counseling services to black women and girls support the ACLU national bail fund no don't support the ACLU no no if you are donating to the ACLU, you need to stop right now. I'm listening, says, can we listen to Thomas Sowell, Candace Owens, Larry Elder, Colonel Ellen West? Will they be in the list in that app? I think that's a very good question. Someone should download that app and, and tell us. Matter. Support, support the Institute for Recruitment of Teachers. We've been doing the work of getting, uh, of, of moving the needle of the racial makeup of teachers and professors in this country for 30 years. It doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> Tech Priest Fisher here says, I will gladly accept any white person's I'm not in our donations for research into alcohol. Yes. You guys can Commit all PayPal Tech Priest Fisher right now. A, like reoccurring donation. Um, because these organizations need to be able to count on your patronage. And also represent, recognize that support um, is also emotional and mental as well. I wrote an article called Five Ways to Support Your Colleagues of Color right now. Um, your Black colleagues, excuse me. Um, but also your colleagues of color. Offer that support if you are in a position to check in on your... So why don't you talk about what's in the article rather than just saying, I wrote an article about how to support your colleagues of color. Friends, um, show your support. Recognize the moment we're in, right? Okay, so the, the three S's I've got so far are show up, which is essentially like come to my webinar, shut up and listen, which is come to my webinar and don't question what I'm saying, and pay them money. Those are the three things, like support through financial means, pay them money. That's it. Show up, watch a webinar, shut up and listen. Don't question what I'm saying. Pay them money. Have we cured racism yet? I'll make a donation to the NAACP right now if someone can tell me that we've cured racism and we can just stop now. We're in a moment of racial revolution. Don't pretend everything's just copacetic right now. It's not. So show up. Lend your support emotionally and mentally to your friends and the people of color that you love in your life. Um, the last one, which is probably the hardest one, or not the hardest one, the most long-term one, is school yourself. How is that different than showing up? Okay, now I completely understand why she said I made these up at five five o'clock in the morning. Like. School yourself and show up are exactly the same. That means 
do the work. How is that different than showing up? You bought the books. Congrats. Now you have to read the books. Oh, you've downloaded God. all the podcasts. Thank God. Congrats. Now you have to listen to the podcast. How is that different than showing up? If you do not know something about the history of race and racism, and believe me, there's a lot that you don't know. It is not the burden of black people and people of color to educate white people about racism. So go and do the work. Do what it takes to educate yourself. There was a recent article that came out. They all have this same look when they're they're like, it's just like, it's this smug, like looking down of the nose. It's like all the same, always with the furrow, the furrowed brow. We got the furrowed brow again. Out by Vulture's Lauren Michelle Jackson, which talked about anti-racism as a vanity project, where the goal is no longer to learn more about race, power, and capital but to spring closer to the enlightened order of the anti-racist. And that's what I talked about when I say anti-racism is not about you. It is about the, the liberation from oppression for black and brown people. So a way to continue to move towards that goal is to school yourself and, and do the work. For me, when I started my own anti-racist journey, for lack of a better term, and I hate that term because it's very kind of new ag to describe something that i should have been doing my entire life um when i okay artists here our artress sorry has given us um a little bit more information about this app the preview for the app seems to be a blm resource aggregation feed with articles about black issues places to send money to black people videos of black black issues all right so nonsense essentially it's nonsense is what it is i'm listening one of the five things she wrote about was no when you are virtue signaling <laughs> Is that real? Did you go look up that article? Did she... <laughs> Please let that be real. I started this several years ago. I'm a very type A person and I like checking off lists. So for me, when I started out, I committed to reading two books a month that were either by black scholars or were about the history of race and racism in this country or were about critical theory. I have a lineup every single week of five podcasts that I listen to that specifically address social justice and issues of race and racism. I listen to them every week. And then I try to commit to reading an article, at least one article every single day that is about social justice or racial equity. These are very tangible. I am constantly doing the work to keep myself brainwashed. Steps that I take to school myself every single day to make sure that I am engaged continuously in this work. And maybe that works for you, maybe it doesn't. By the way, after this um, webinar, you'll get a list of resources that I've put together that have recommendations for podcasts and documentaries and things that you can watch to get started. But for me, that was a really great way to fold it into my life, right? Because I think a lot of people get so overwhelmed by what they don't know, that they don't know how to take on this self-study in a sustainable way. And you're not going to learn the history of race and racism in the next three months. You're just not. It is a lifelong process. Doing the work is a lifelong process of self-flagellation. I don't know it. I, and I don't think you'll ever learn the full depths and, and complications of the history of race and racism. But that means you still need to be diving in and trying. And so I think that for many people, the inclination is to kind of gorge themselves on sources and get so overwhelmed that, like I said, they burn out and they stop. So figure out how to school yourself sustainably. Figure out how to fold the reading and watching and listening into your everyday life. Make it as important as any other habit or self-care practice that you would make time for. Oh my God. She just equated being an anti-racist to doing self-care work when at the very beginning of the webinar, she was like, this is going to burn you out. You can't, you have to take breaks and white people have the benefit of being able to take breaks, but black and brown people don't. That's how you engage long-term. So the four S's, um, show up physically, mentally, emotionally, shut up and listen. Decenter your white voice, support financial, emotional, and mental, and school yourself. Do the work. 
if you go off and read White Fragility, watch 13th, the documentary, and listen to a few podcasts, your work is not done. It is not enough to read White Fragility. You have to flagellate yourself every day for the rest of your life to make up for your inherent racism. I really want to emphasize that. This is a lifetime commitment. Also, this is just my own caveat. If you do buy White Fragility, and I think it's a great book, I think it offers a very profound framework, make sure that you also are reading the books by scholars of color about racism. I <laughs> She just blatantly, like, well, like, in, indirectly acknowledged that Robin D'Angelo has made a lot of money as a white lady teaching white people that they're racist. And she's like, you know, don't just don't just buy the book by the white lady, buy the book by Ibram X. Kendi as well. I send you a whole list of recommendations, but the irony is not lost on me that the number one New York Times bestseller about racism in this country right now is written by a white woman. No shade again, but think about the optics of that. A racist white woman. So I have received a few great questions. And she probably thinks it's like racism that led to Robin D'Angelo's book being number one. And she's actually probably right in that regard. It is. Why wasn't How to Be an Anti-Racist the number one book? Why was it White Fragility? That's racist. And I know that um, in the Q&A, uh, in the chat box, um, Jen has been collecting them as well. So um, I'm going to answer two of them because I think they're really good overarching questions that probably a lot of folks have. And okay, we have now spent 40 minutes... She's given us no information, no practical steps. All she said is show up, shut up and listen, give black people money and read books. But she hasn't she hasn't talked about like anything, any any like there's been no research. There's been no studies. There's been no no empirical evidence to back up any claims. There's nothing. It's shut up. Give black people money. Read the books we tell you to read. That's it. There's no specifics. And this is what it's like in every single one of these trainings. These people make thousands of dollars. I don't know what she made, but like in general, in general terms, these people make thousands of dollars doing these trainings that don't say anything. And then, um, Jen, if it's okay with you, we can open it up to any others that come in. So please do type them in. So the first one that I got is... Data is white. Data is racist. Empirical evidence, racist. It feels as if anything I say or do is a reflection of white supremacy. Short of withdrawing from society altogether, how can I and others engage in a meaningful and constructive way to change the systemic wrongs? Okay, 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 okay. That question was definitely planted. I need to listen to that question again. Hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Two of them, because I think they're really good overarching questions that probably a lot of folks have. And then, um, Jen, if it's okay with you, we can open it up to any others that come in. So please do type them in. So the first one that I got is, it feels as if anything I say or do is a reflection of white supremacy. Short of withdrawing from society altogether, how can I and others engage in a meaningful and constructive way to change the systemic wrongs? No one asked that question. That's planted. Right. This is everything we talked about, right? The feelings right now are for many of us who are... You're having feelings. And you might want to withdraw because of those feelings. Those feelings might make you feel bad. And that's why you need to keep getting up every single day and doing the work. The High Priestess of Anti-Racism. Thank you, Carl. Just kind of waking up to anti-racist work. They're so painful that our inclination is to like withdraw from society altogether. Um, that is a natural response. It is also a response that you need to push through. So you need to fight that off and double down on your level of engagement. You're going to mess up. You have to be okay with that. And that's painful, right? Because I, I think if you've just woken up to an understanding of racism in this country, you are crippled by the anxiety that you would unintentionally do harm again. And it keeps us from speaking out. out. I'm not crippled by anything. Beat that cognitive dissonance down. Beat it down. Do it. Do it. Oh. You are going to mess up. I mess up 
all the time. I have messed up constantly. I'm going to continue to mess up. That's part of it. That's part of me. I make, I, I behave racist towards my colleagues. Robin D'Angelo writes about this in her book. Like, my colleagues forgive me for my acts of racism against them all the time. And I will always make mistakes because I am socialized to be racist because I was born white and I make mistakes all the time. I do racist things to my colleagues all the time. And yet people still pay me thousands of dollars to teach them how not to be racist. Me being a white person in this society. You have to reckon with that. And it's not okay, right? Like it's not okay that you're messing up, but it's still gonna happen. So how do you contend with that? When you realize you've messed up. Because some people are glutton for punishment. That's how. How do you take that knowledge, educate yourself, and then come back and do better again and again and again? It's really hard. It's really, really, really hard, but it's something that you have to contend with. And it's something that you have to, it's a muscle that you have to flex, right? Be okay with saying, I don't know too. There, but there is a lot that you're not going to know. And I think that a lot of white people get kind of paralyzed by that. Or I, I've certainly found when I want to confront racism, sometimes my inclination is, is like, oh, if I don't have like the FBI statistics at hand to engage in this conversation, then I shouldn't engage in it at all. <laughs> If I don't have data to support my racism, then I just shouldn't do it at all. We don't need data. Data is racist. And that's not the case, right? To interrupt racism, you don't have to, you, you don't have to be a, an expert to interrupt racism. In fact, it's more important than ever that you interrupt racism, even if you're not quite sure what it is that's wrong about it. If something is landing wrong with you, there's a sign it is probably wrong. So if that's a kind of sketchy comment that your colleague says speak up and it's okay to say i don't know this woman in any normal work environment would be calling out her colleagues for racism left and right and she probably wouldn't actually contribute very much to the workplace because she's given us nothing to indicate that she would have 40 minutes into the presentation and hopefully if she worked in any normal environment she would be fired immediately for acting like a karen it's okay to say i don't know why that didn't land right but i I'm not understanding your, your intentionality behind that. Can you explain it to me? More than ever, it is, our, it is on us to interrupt racism when we see it in both covert and overt forms. And we people who like call their, their, you know, call other people out for being racist. I'm sorry. Like, I have no sympathy for anything that happens to them when they're like, excuse me, do you know? that you were just racist in that interaction. I, I have no sympathy for these people at all. If anything negative happens to them when they're being a dick. We do not have to be experts to do that. We just have to be committed. I think another thing that's really important is just normalizing conversations around race and racism. You know, there's, it's- Don't they make it so appealing to do this anti-racist work too? They're like, shut up, listen, show up be uncomfortable doesn't make it so appealing for you to want to like come in and better yourself this is not how people who are doing real personal development work act right they're not like shut up and listen to us like i've actually been um again I, like i've been watching for people who um just joined i was talking about benjamin voices documentary on evergreen state college and i don't know how that one um Jam jamil i think was his name that one kid that was like in charge he treated everyone like dirt i don't know why people followed him and listened to him because he was such i mean he was kind of like a rat bastard and you know i i attribute it to the fact that like he's in college like that's the time to kind of be one of those people but if i was going to school with that kid i would be like you're being kind of a dick like why should i listen to you and follow you um, guys, if you're enjoying this live stream, please remember to smash that like button. Thank you. It still feels very uncomfortable for most people in this country to talk about. Not for me. I mean, my husband sometimes is like, can we please, we have to talk about something else. Like, <laughs> my, my husband. She just admitted that her husband doesn't want to take it anymore. <laughs> I, I, oh God, how many years do we give her marriage? I don't give her very many. You've been talking about it all day. 
But I think that the only way that you can begin to grapple with these concepts is by talking it out. Dude, if her husband ever sees this live stream, dude, get in touch with me. I will buy you a beer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you ended up in this position. I'm sure you were, I'm sure she was normal when you married her, but she is now a pod person and you're going to need to go through a process of coming to grips with that. It's not there all hope is not lost. She can wake up. But like reach out I, I will buy you a beer. We'll have a conversation. I won't tell her. I won't put it on the internet. But if you ever find this video, just know that we're there for you and you're fine and we love you just like you are and we won't make you confess your racism. Certainly, you're not going to work through understandings of white supremacy in a vacuum. So find people that you can talk it out with. Normalize conversations with your family members, with your friends, with colleagues. Her husband is 100% white. 100%. There is no way she's not married to a white guy. Colleagues, the more and more we treat race as something that we can't talk about, the less we are able to show up and actually interrupt racism as anti-racist. So normalize those conversations. So that actually brings me to my second point, which is, um, or excuse me, my second question. So I got the question, I teach kindergarten in a mostly white community. I'm not sure where to start this conversation. So um, what I think the person wait, is- Wait, 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 wait. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I was, we were making a sex joke, but we actually have to take this Unless question seriously. Unless we are seriously. able to show up and actually interrupt racism as anti-racist. So normalize those conversations. So that actually brings me to my second point, which is, um, or excuse me, my second question. So I got the question, I teach kindergarten in a mostly white community. I'm not sure where to start this conversation. You do not have conversations with kindergartners about racism. The correct answer is you don't have conversation with kindergartners teaching them that they are racist. That is the correct answer. So um, what I think the person is saying here is, is essentially like, how do I teach anti-racism to kids? No. Oh my God. Okay. 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 Let's just come to grips with the fact that a webinar on the University of New Hampshire's website is about to talk about teaching anti-racism to five-year-olds. Chris Sununu, you hear that? Five-year-olds. Jenny's getting inky, inky with it. Says, I'm seven minutes behind. The reason you can't ask Blacks about it is because white people don't make money off it. They throw a bone just to look legit. All right. I think that's how I'm going to answer it. Um, so if that was not your intention, please write it in the, in the, her answer had, been, dude, I am so glad we're watching this webinar because this is like a treasure. Tr this is a treasure trove of what should not be happening in New Hampshire and why it is so, so, so important that HB 544 actually passes. Thank you. University of New Hampshire for this wondrous gift that you've given us. Questions. So again, normalize conversations about race and racism. Um, I'm sure many of you have... Normalize conversations about race and racism with five-year-olds. Have had the experience or remember an experience where, uh, let, let's just say, I'll use myself as an example. I was in a grocery store when I was like five years old and I still remember saying to my mom, mom, that woman's black and my mother how do you think she responded was like, shh, don't say that. That's rude. Sh so shut down a conversation about race and racism. And that was not, that's not a conversation about race and racism. That's an observation that someone would, that a five-year-old might make if they're not used to seeing black people. That was not coming out of mean spiritedness. It certainly wasn't coming out of her awareness of her own racist worldview. She was raised in a time where it was considered rude to talk about race and racism. But if you inculcate your kids in that kind of mindset, they are never going to feel comfortable asking questions. They're yeah. never going to feel comfortable bringing up things that they see because they're taught it's not something to talk about. I'm speaking to white kids here. 
only white kids are allowed to ask questions about race. Black kids are not allowed to ask questions about race. Brown kids are not allowed to ask questions about race. That's what you just said, right? This is only advice for white kids, not for any other race. So normalize these conversations. Normalize conversations around inequity, the history of this country. You can talk about these things without necessarily, you know, I don't know, I don't want to say traumatizing your kids, but you can, there are ways to talk to five-year-olds about systemic inequities that are age appropriate, but also not shying away from the challenges of those conversations, right? Kids are smart. They know these things. Like they- she is promoting talking about racism to five-year-olds. She's promoting teaching anti-racism to five-year-olds. Let's just re- take a second just to wrap our heads around that. And this is completely normal to these people. This is completely normal. Like she has no gumption about doing this. So she's not like, you know what? Maybe, maybe five is a time where they should be learning other stuff. No racism. That's what we need to teach them. TPS says my six-year-old daughter got called racist by her black BFF. Didn't understand the word and stayed with friends with help from teachers. Thank God. Uh, thanks God for that, for Texas handled correctly. Yes. They can sense these things. They're smart. They can take these things in. And the more you normalize these kind of conversations and are able to say, I don't know about the stuff you don't know about, you are giving your kids the critical thinking skills to begin to think about these things for themselves. Another thing is talk about a side of history that your children might not be exposed to. Um, You know, one of the things that I heard time and time again in the class that I taught teaching race is how angry my white students were that they hadn't been taught this in their K-12 experience. I, I swear to God, we... No, 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 I don't believe her. I do not believe that any K-12 through student was like, I'm really pissed that you didn't teach me how to be an anti-racist. We spent the first half of the semester with the students, their reaction papers were them just being like, how did no one teach me this? She is lying. I don't believe her for one red second. Show, I want receipts. I want evidence. And that's because we still have a very white one. Dude, I'm going to tell you what. I, 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 for a very brief moment, I taught college students. And college students are literally only interested in getting an A. That's it. This is why I don't teach anymore. Like, they are only interested in getting an A. They are not interested in introspection. They are not interested in learning. They are only interested in getting an A. And so I don't believe for one red second, not one, that students in K through 12 in large numbers were like, I can't believe we didn't, we didn't self-flagellate ourselves for 12 years. Washed K-12 curriculum. No. We still have a curriculum that um, undermines and erases the lived experiences and the oppression of Black people. Okay, I'm just curious. How many people in the chat learned about slavery learned about the KKK, learned about the civil rights movement, learned about all of these things when you were in school, because I absolutely did. And I went to school in Lily White, Vermont, in in not a very good school district. I started learning about this stuff when I was in like elementary school, it was like fifth, fifth grade, maybe sixth grade, I was getting into middle school. But that's when they started teaching me about this stuff. How many people in the chat learned about this stuff in school? Yes, exactly. Yeah, slavery, civil rights movement, like, like most people learned about this stuff in school. Michael, thank you for the super sticker. I appreciate it. And people of color, as well as their victories, as well as their triumphs. So talk about those histories with your kids. Go buy these books, um, listen to podcasts, watch movies together. Try to expose your white kids to an understanding of history that they're not getting in schools. Well, why aren't they getting it in schools? Why aren't they being taught about this in schools? It makes no sense. And this is really important, right? Because um, otherwise you are getting, your kids are receiving a very one-dimensional, one-sided understanding of their history that they have no control over, right? And that you have no control over. So the more you you present a nuanced, multi-layered, complex understanding of the experiences of Black people and people of color in this country, 
the more your kids will be able to engage with this work from early on. Those are the big things I'd say. The last thing I would say is, as an educator, if you feel that the curriculum that your student is being taught or your kid is being taught is too whitewashed or erases particular voices in the narrative of the history of this country, lobby your local school district, write letters, start a petition, get other parents involved. I mean, the answer, like, why is she using the word normalize so much? Because they want to convince you that this is not already normal. They want to convince you that this stuff is not happening. They want to convince you that you need that new normal when I'm sorry, like we really didn't. Um, one of the areas that parents have uh, actually a good amount of say in is the curriculum. And um, this is a place where you can use your white voice to to really lobby for a more inclusive curriculum. Use your white voice to lobby for a more inclusive curriculum. Do that, the work. Um, that again, will we'll, we'll, we'll fight these racist sentiments um, that are so pervasive um, among white people because we didn't know, right? We weren't taught it. And so now is the time to make sure it is taught. So those were the two questions I received ahead of time. We have um, a lot of questions coming in. If you do have a question, um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom. Um, that we will get to. So let me just grab. Glorious. And let me um let me actually just share. I, I have to admit, Micah, I actually kind of think that that's funny. I probably I probably would have laughed uncontrollably if I had witnessed that scenario. I have to admit. Oh God, let me see. Sorry, guys. Um, or do what Morgan said to Don. Do, you don't want to stop racism and stop talking about it. Oh yes, you didn't care for racism in school. It just aimed for the A. Yep. Yep, yep. Four S's of anti-racism so that you can all see the steps. Oh, yes. Hold let's see the slide. Second. Let's see the slide of the four S's that you made up at 5 a.m. All right. Go ahead, Jen. There okay. it is. So the first question is for shut up and listen. Okay. 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 Let me, let me tell you how this works. Like, she just talked for how long? 46, 47 minutes. She wasn't prepared to give this presentation. She just put together a slide at 5 a.m. She's like, oh, shit, I have to do this UNH presentation today. And then she just filled up the rest. Whatever she's getting paid with this, she got paid too much because she didn't prepare at all. That's what happened. And is it OK to educate our friends and family, for example, on social media? Is it OK to educate our friends and family on social media? No. No. Shut up. Shut up. Follow rule number two. Shut up. Not about how I feel, but about the concepts you were talking about, no. for example, or something I've learned in anti-racist work. I know we can share the voices of people of color, but it is wrong. But is it wrong to also share what we've learned or are learning? Yes. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, hmm. I have very mixed feelings about this, right? Um, no. So the, the first answer I would say is no, I don't think, I absolutely think you should be challenging and engaging your friends and loved ones. And I absolutely think resource sharing is, is critical in this. I mean, hello, why am I here? You know, <laughs> I am certainly not shutting up right now. Um, but I think that there's a balance to that. Right. Um, and for me to be quite frank, before I post anything, I have to do kind of an internal gut check of what are my motives for, for posting this? Because as I wrote about in, in the five ways to support your black colleagues, performative allyship and virtue signaling is a very real thing. And that's when white people are trying, trying to kind of prove we're one of the good white people. And so we kind of feign outrage. Dude, if you feel the need to prove you're one of the good white people, you are part of the problem. I know I'm a good person. I don't need validation from anti-racist educators. ...or moral indignation, or we are engaged in the work, but in a very superficial level. It's more about our own, our own self-image, right? Wanting to be seen as a good white ally. That did she just admit this is all a virtue signal? I'm pre I'm reasonably sure she did. She just admitted that this was all a massive virtue signal. It has anything to do with actually digging into the work. So I don't say that if you are posting something that's your own resources, your own opinions, that that's a problem. But I do think it's important to do that internal gut check every time you're putting something out there. 
because it just serves to remind you what's the ultimate goal here, right? If you're moving a conversation towards an understanding of liberation for your white friends and family members. Wait, I didn't think it was the, wait, did she just say that this was about liberating your white friends and family members? No, it's not. What are you talking about? I thought liberation was supposed to be for black and brown people. That's in line with the mission. Or black, black and brown bodies, I should say, probably. Mission, right? I hope I answered that. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Jen. Um, how would you talk about the intersectionality? Mm. Oh. Intersectionality drink. Bingo. Bingo card. Um, with your example of Andover and Lawrence, because it's not just about race, it's about the intersection of race and class. Oh, my God. So they just admitted that this is a class thing, not a race thing, but they're like, it's intersectional. And it's more complicated. Right, 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 right. And that's a great question. And I think intersection, you have to take an intersectional lens when you're talking about anti-racist work, right? Because all of these things feed into each other, right? And that's a great question. So Lawrence, yes, uh, socioeconomically, it's much lower. Uh, socioeconomically, it's, it's a, it, it is poorer than Andover. It is also way less white than Andover. And those two things aren't mistakes, right? So I'm not talking about Lawrence. Uh, Do you know why she's not talking about Lowell? Because, and Lowell is like right next to there. Because there are a lot of poor white people in Lowell. A lot of poor white people in Lowell. Um, being not safe because it's poorer. When I said those things, I was talking about the intersection of a lower socioeconomic status and a particular particular. Oh, racial oh, 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 now we're talking about socioeconomic status, but it's all intersectional. That's what I meant. I meant it was a combination of the two. And so it's a great question. We always have to take an intersectional lens when thinking about liberation, right? Because, I mean, without getting to one of the sources that I recommend is Kimberly Crenshaw, who talks about intersectionality, which again, talks about the intersections of sexism, classism, racism, ableism, talks about the ways in which oppressed identities intersect. So yes, to that end. Hey, yo, Black Magic, why haven't you sent me that email? Don't think I've forgotten. Lawrence is also a, so a lower socioeconomic status town but it is also a more racially diverse town. And those things are not mutually exclusive. So for the support part of this, what is um, the best way to emotionally support black and brown people? That's a great question. And I, I don't think I have an answer for that because if I had an answer, that would be assuming that every black and brown person in this country needs the same thing right now, right? Like, oh, 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 oh. We wouldn't want to make assumptions collectively about black and brown people. We only want to make assumptions about white people as a collective. We don't want to make assumptions about black and brown people collectively. Um, Actually, hang on. We have a side question, guys. I need some help from you because Salty Nicholas Prize says, Carlin, do you have a name for your followers yet? I don't have a name for my followers. And this is something I've actually been thinking about. I need a clever name for my followers. I've got some ideas, but if you have ideas about what clever name I should I should call my followers, um, please, please put them in the chat. We'll have a little vote, maybe. VT Num says, listening to her reminds me of Tom Cruise talking about Scientology. It is a cult. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That their experience is monolithic, right? And it's obviously not. So, you know, I have Black friends in my life right now who are engaging with me as if we would any other day. We are talking about ice cream. We're talking about TV shows. I have other Black friends. <laughs> Did she just like say like I I I treat my my black and brown friends like normal people? We talk about ice cream and TV shows. I don't know what the big deal is. <laughs> and colleagues that are like I I do not want to talk. I'll text you when I want to talk. And so for me to assume that different people in my life all need the same thing right now is really hard. Um, 
I think that you can let. I kind of like the idea. Like a lot of you guys are playing with like the crew with a K. I kind of, I kind of like that. I kind of like that. We're gonna. Th I'm not committed to it yet. But we're gonna see. And it's a good on one. On a now. very practical level, I check in, and I say I've texted my friends and colleagues just thinking about. She's you. definitely a double dipper. And hundred percent. Um, some of them have texted thanks, which in my mind says, I don't want to talk to you, white lady. And some of them have said, oh, I love that. Thanks so much. Wait, 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 wait. Some of her friends, her friends have said, I don't want to talk to you, white lady. Like, okay, okay. What that means. <laughs> like she texts her friends to say, hey, checking in. How are you doing? And they're like, I don't want to talk to you, white lady. You know what that means? It means she has token friends, people that like aren't really her friends and that she doesn't really know, but that she keeps in her life just because they're black or brown. And she thinks that makes her anti-racist. She's like, I'm going to, I'm going to pander to these black and brown people. And they're like, well, you don't even know anything about us other than our skin color. And so she texts them. She's like, hey, how are you doing? I'm just checking in. They're like, leave me alone. You don't care about me. You only care about my skin color. It's like, that's very nice. And they do want to engage these are your friends, right? These are your colleagues, right? It can be very hard to know what to do right now. Excuse me. But I think the worst thing you could do is, is nothing. Um, so I think it's, it's valid and worthy to check in. But I also think that you, um, you have to recognize that not everyone needs the same thing. And that's not a sign you're doing it wrong. It just means that not everyone needs the same thing right now. This, I really do want to say though, this period that we are in, this, this racial revolution, please recognize how emotionally draining it probably is, probably is for many of your friends and colleagues and family members of color. Dude, if you are texting your friends and they're saying, don't bother me, white lady, like you're the one emotionally taxing them. You're the one that's not providing emotional support if they don't want to talk to you. I do not want to minimize it for one minute. It is probably a lot right now. So please recognize that, I think, at the baseline when you take those things into account. Great. Uh, the next question is, what do you exactly mean by the work? What would be, you know, an example, I guess, of saying what the work is do the work great question so do the work means read the books listen to the podcasts watch the speakers hey 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 tech priest fisher says i think pocs are like rubik's cubes to her can't solve them but it makes her feel smarter for having one at her desk i will have you know that my husband can solve rubik's cubes and he can do it in under 20 seconds he has a whole collection i'll post a video sometime of my husband doing a rubik's cube so maybe people like her can't solve rubik's cubes but some people can watch the documentaries. It means whatever the gaps in your knowledge are, go out there and find the resources to address the gaps in your knowledge. Um, that's what do the work means. I recognize, even though I teach this stuff, there is still so much I don't know. There are still so many concepts that I have only a rudimentary understanding of. So I am going out and I am learning about that stuff so I can I can interrupt racism from a better and more knowledgeable place again and again and again. So that's what do the work means. It means educate yourself and find the answers on your own without putting that burden on black people or people of color when you recognize those gaps in your racial knowledge. Um, as an educator, what would you say to parents who say, can't you just focus on the curriculum? This is too much for my kids. What would you say if, as a parent, I told you to stop teaching my kids foolishness and racism? Let's hear. Good lord! I mean, why wouldn't you want to teach your kids question, racism? But kind of like, do you want your kids to develop critical thinking? <laughs> oh my god! She just said that your kids can't develop critical thinking if you don't teach them to be anti-racist. I, I don't mean to be. Uh, I don't mean to be shady in that. Yes, you do. K-12 curriculum, if you actually dive into the history of how it's created, if you dive into any kind of nuanced understanding of how K-12 curriculum is created, it is problematic. It is at the whims of different administrations. 
what stories it chooses to include versus what stories it chooses to erase all over the place. School is problematic unless it's teaching what I want them to teach. So, no, I don't trust the curriculum because my K-12... Yeah, anytime someone says, I don't mean to be shady, they mean to be shady. Do not believe them is what led me to a position where I was 26 years old before I realized systemic racism existed. I was 26 years old before I met a black person in this country. And then so, I realized that I'm a racist and I am spending the rest of my life self-flagellating. First of all, your kids can handle it and your kids should be taught to think critically about the information they're receiving. The number one thing I said in my course and my students got so sick of it I was like, whose stories are being told and why? And who has the power in this dynamic? If you think about an understanding of race. If you're teaching the course. Oh, I don't know why I just double clicked into that. Whatever. If you are teaching the course and you're, and you're teaching students, like, why are people learning this? Like, who's te who's, whose stories are we teaching and why? You are literally teaching the course, dude. It's your choice. Race and racism as systems of power and privilege, then absolutely your kids can handle it. And your kids should be, should be taught, it, not even if they're questioning, you know, they should be taught to question who is giving them this information, who is in the position to tell them what knowledge is valuable and what isn't. And maybe that's revolutionary of me, but I certainly resent many things yes, about my kids. exactly exactly i'm listening like shut up and listen is exactly the opposite of critical thinking it is the opposite there is no thinking going on when you're telling someone to shut up and listen k-12 curriculum and my students felt the same so i think the worst case scenario for me is that my daughter who's 18 months old right now doesn't come to an understanding of race and racism in this country until she's in her 20s what an absolute failure that would be on my behalf here i can see her question. furrow brow from here what are some ways to help the fight specifically in terms of the problem of police and une unequal treatment of black people i mm, i wish i had a simpler answer for this um I think practically speaking, um, if you are comfortable with it, if you are committed to standing up against um, police brutality. PG says, thank you for the super chat. Do you think after you get COT banned everywhere that all the anti-racist trainers will switch to selling timeshares? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Listen, I don't think it's realistic to think that this is ever going to be a concept that's fully banned. At the end of the day, like we do have free speech in this country. If they want to do private seminars about how to be an anti-racist, they should be free to do it. My problem is that when people are forced to participate in these against their will and that their speech is compelled by by their their employer, their school, what have you. If someone wants to go off to a hotel for the weekend and have a little anti-racist training, like I think it's dumb and stupid, but like that's their freedom. And um, I, I think that people like this will continue to do very well. I think they'll continue to make a lot of money. Um, but my concern is making it possible for everyone to be able to not do this training if they so choose. You have to opt into it. If you want to be told that you're a racist and self-flagellate yourself for your entire life, it's a free country, man. It's not what I would choose. But just don't force others to adhere to this ideology just because you yourself chose it. And in this country then one of the best things that you can do is actually show up to protest if you're comfortable with it. And I don't, I know in the time of COVID, I can't necessarily sanction that. And I, I'm not for anyone who's not. <laughs> Remember this was taking place like what, a month and a half after George Floyd's death. So she's like, show up and protest, but, but don't, but show up and protest, but don't. They were so conflicted about this. But one of the number one things that we as white people can do is actually show up, put our bodies on the line in the same way that black and brown people have been for centuries ain't no one's body was put on the line in a black lives matter protest i'm sorry like no one was like it was fine oh my god another thing that you can do is begin to really educate yourself around the terminology around police and the criminal justice 
No, Casper, that is not true. That is fundamentally untrue. What Victor did on our first date was move really heavy furniture, and it was very impressive, and he did it by himself, and that's when I was like, I'm going to marry you, because you're moving really heavy furniture, and it's always good to have a mover around the house. It was not the Rubik's Cube. The Rubik's Cube happened later. The system in this country. Watch 13th. Watch the Khalif Browder documentary. Watch When They See Us. Um, read articles about what it means to defund versus abolish the police. Read Angela Davis. Really arm yourself with an understanding of how this system has existed, how we got to this current moment. Um, I think really this is... Yes, TBS, I agree. I find the term, the bodies term completely dehumanizing. I absolutely hate it. It is one of my biggest pet peeves an opportunity to get involved on the local level to learn about if this is something you're committed to to learn about where your local police budgets come from how they are allocated how they have evolved over the past few years um, that is a really really good place to start if you want to kind of start digging into that i also wrote an article that came out on nbc called um that basically um talked about all the different terminology around the defund the police argument. So please check that out. It's uh, it really just goes through the terms and explains them in kind of their different contexts. So that question is from somebody who lives um, up in Hennecker, New Hampshire, and she says oh. she or he has been practicing medicine for a while and doesn't really, you know, have many black patients, have black people that live in that area. So you know what would you recommend for her as far or him, sorry, it's an anonymous person. Um, as far as you know anti-racism anti-racist education new hampshire is like 95 percent white nowhere in new hampshire is going to have a significant amount of clients that are non-white that's a great question and honestly I maybe like 90 percent white but it's it's a lot there's a lot of white people here let's just be honest i would say that um a place where you could probably start is in educating other white colleagues. The health disparities and health outcomes for people of this you know, color in this country are so, so disproportionate. I mean, one in four black women in this country die in childbirth. That is extraordinary for 2020. And that is- You guys remember, I don't know, like you probably all don't know this. Does, and it, does anyone watch the show Evil? Like it's it was on CBS or something, and Victor and I started watching it on Netflix, and it was like an okay show until it got to the episode where it was like it was trying to make the argument that a woman came back to life in the morgue of a hospital because of racism. And I, I remember the moment where I shouted at Victor. I was like, turn it off, turn it off. We are not watching this show anymore because the show was like the reason she came back to life in the morgue was racism. And then Three weeks later, the lead actress in that show started fighting with me on Twitter. <laughs> it was the best. That was one of the best things that's ever happened. It's a sign of a deeply broken healthcare system when it comes to supporting black and brown individuals. So if you yourself are kind of not coming, not in a space where you can actively make a difference in advocating for black and brown patients, that I think the best thing you can do is start and get in, start to get involved with your colleagues and start to talk to them and educate yourself about the very real health disparities and how in health outcomes um, for different racial populations in this country. That's what I'd recommend. I'm sorry, I'm sweating so much. <laughs> it's all right. It's this is so hard. Okay, so it's, it's so o'clock, hard still to teach a webinar. Questions, so we'll try to get to what we can and then we can all. Adrian's we'll right. I'm going to finish my beer. And if people can get their answers. Okay. Um, this question is, I know some people are hesitant to say Black Lives Matter because they don't agree with the organization. Oh. Even if they agree with the movement. Oh. And Black Lives Do Matter. What do you think about that? And oh. What's the best language to use to allow allyship? Wait. A rare, good question. What if you do not agree with Black Lives Matter, the organization, but you do, in fact, agree with the concept that Black Lives Matter? Now, quick poll in the chat. Quick poll. How many of you agree with the term, not the organization, the term Black Lives Matter? Do people in the chat generally like, do you think I, I I think Black Lives Matter? I think brown lives matter. I think Asian lives matter. I think white lives even matter too. But sure, I can get behind the term Black Lives Matter. Fine, fine. Okay. 
even if I don't like the organization because they're a whole bunch of Marxists, yes, we have agreement in the chat that we do believe generally, though not, you know, entirely, that black lives do matter. Okay, let's keep going. ...in anti-racist work. Uh, uh, that, that's very hard for me because I think if you support the movement, you support the organization. Oh, wrong answer. Like, that was like a layup, man. That was a layup. And she fumbled it. The, the organization exists to further the movement. And no, no, I wrong. The organization does not exist to further the movement. The organization exists to further Marxism and to destabilize the country. That's why the organization exists. If the organization existed to further the movement, they would damn well be supporting Black-owned businesses that were destroyed during the riots that were going on while this webinar was taking place. I think if you're really... If you are in a space where you are concerned about some kind of dissonance between the movement versus the organization, a great thing to do is actually educate yourself. So follow. If you don't like the organization, it just means that you are not educated. Follow the Black Lives Matter movement and the hashtag on both Twitter and Instagram. And I think that will show you... Um, you know, kind of some of the things that are coming out of the movement and the ways in which, excuse me, the organization and the ways in which she doesn't even, she can't even keep it straight. Which they are engaging in the movement. I mean, they are the movement, right? Um, no, I don't think that that's true. I think that there are, I mean, and I, I com I'm committed to this and I know a lot of you don't agree with me, but I think that I have no issue with most everyday Black Lives Matter people. I really don't. And I don't think many of you do either. I have issue with the organization because it is a Marxist organization. I do not agree with it. I do not agree with how they're spending their money. I do not agree with what their mission is. Uh, but in insofar as like saying like Black Lives Matter and we don't want Black people or really anyone to be um, innocently killed by police officers, I'm, co I'm cool with that goal. Now, we might disagree on if there's a problem, but I'm cool with the goal. I can get behind the goal. Black Lives Matter as an organization serves to uplift the effort towards racial justice. No, no, wrong. No, it doesn't. In this country. So that means they plan marches. They organize marches. They organize speakers. They lobby um, politicians. They uh, set up national bail funds. They're, they're kind of doing all of they set up bail funds for people who loot Black-owned businesses and destroy them, but they don't support the Black-owned businesses that were destroyed with, by the people that they just bailed out. The work of the movement. I think a really great place to start as well is to actually read some of the autobiographies. Um, the autobiography, excuse me, by um, Patrice uh, Colors, who's one of the... Patrice has flat out said she's a Marxist. It's on video. Founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and to follow Opal Tometi and Patrice Colors and uh, Alicia Garza, I think is the third one, on social media, because that gives you an idea of the people who are actually pulling the strings of the Black Lives Matter organization, what they are doing. And um, I just think the, let me put it this way. I don't think the Black Lives Matter organization is somehow not fully connected and propelling the movement of Black Lives Matter. That's what I'd say about that. Okay. There is a question. Um, I agree with what you're saying about being anti-racist and not just not racist. What about our need to be anti-discrimination about race, nationality, age, sex, religion, and all other human differences? I love this because there are obviously trolls watching this webinar and they're like, how do I phrase the question correctly so I can get a point in and yet not not get in trouble for it. They're trying. I have to give I have to give the UNH trolls credit for trying their very best. I mean, I think that goes back I I might not be understanding the conversation, right? But I think that again, when you take an an intersectional approach to social justice, you recognize that the movement towards liberation for uh different races is the movement towards liberation for kind of all oppressed people in this country, right? Um, it's the movement towards liberation for LGBTQIA individuals. It's the movement towards liberation for um, 
uh, low socioeconomic. Liberation from what? What are they being liberated from? Economic status. It's movement towards liberation for um, people who are ageist or, or people who are discriminated against and experience ageism or ableism or are. This is actually a good idea and I might do this. I'm going to try. We'll see. You know, uh, unhoused. Um, the movement towards social justice, I, I think if you take an intersectional lens, you recognize that you don't get to kind of pick apart the pieces of oppression that you approve with, approve of and don't approve of. You recognize the need for liberation for all oppressed people in all of those different modes. So I, I don't know if I answered I that agree, question Black Magic. Correctly. I would say for those people who do have questions about what intersectionality is, go watch a 20 minute YouTube by Kimberly Crenshaw. Go watch a YouTube video. It's the answer to all your questions. Dr. Kim, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, excuse me. Which Maybe she would expect accept an invitation to come speak to Dr. Carlin Borisenko. What do you think? Really picks it apart in far, far better terms than I can because- if, if this woman ever did come on my channel, I would 100% make her call me doctor. This is part of the privilege of having a doctorate. I would absolutely make this woman call me doctor, 100%. Oh, by the way, she came up with the concept. Um, but I would start looking into that. And I would start thinking about, I would do some deep diving or some soul searching into your own, your own need to really dissect the two or dissect these different kind of categories and identity markers. That's what I'd say. Yeah, Jenny's getting inky with it. I'm actually working on something with Gothics and Christian Watson right now. And I do intend to have Gothics on the channel at some point. Um, and I need to coordinate her with that. And I've, I've intended to have her on the channel for a while. I think Gothics is awesome. Um, there's a question. What can we do to encourage and support the transformation of the systems embedded in our society that are discriminatory? That's not a real question. That's Honestly, tough. I think, and I'm going to, I'm going to go way out on the limb here. I think this requires a level of imagination that white people have never had because. <laughs> this requires a level of imagination that white people have never had. White people have no imagination. It's not like, it's not like Walt Disney was white. It's not like Steve Jobs was white or Elon Musk is white. White people have no imagination. To actually conceptualize, like we, that's why I use the language of liberation because we can conceptualize equality and tolerance and cultural competency. And I don't mean to take away from those terms because they're very important. But can we actually conceptualize what liberation from oppression would look like? For white people, that actually means you would have to contend with the very real ways that you might have to yield your privilege. I think about this sometimes, and I'm just gonna use very simplistic examples. For me, it might mean my daughter has um, a harder time getting into college and university because they're not all predominantly white. Not most of them are predominantly white. It means that I... Dude. Your daughter is never going to have a problem getting into college or university because they're not predominantly white. Like, let's just, like, have a reality check here. That's not true. It might be shut out of particular jobs that uh, I have always felt myself entitled to up until this point. You're actually talking about it being okay to be shut out of a job because of the color of your skin and you're calling yourself an anti-racist educator. I have had two beers and I know that that's crazy. It means it might be harder to get a lease or buy a house in particular neighborhoods. There are very real ways that we have to contend with this. The abolition of police forces is a perfect idea. Can we even conceptualize what that looks like? Defund the police. Great idea. Great idea that Minneapolis is now experiencing the ramifications of. Excellent. The criminal justice system has been around as long as slavery. Can we even conceptualize what it might actually look like? She just picked, compared the police to slave owners. Let's just have it noted. On the University of New Hampshire website, she just compared the police to slave owners. Like, for liberation. 
So I don't have an answer to that, but I think that it, it does require some self-reflection and a very real reckoning of what giving up those privileges that we might not even be aware of right now, what that would look like. Yeah, that's what I'd say. I would say read um, scholars like Bell Hooks. I would say go back to the greats and read W.E.B. Du Bois. Those are some scholars, two scholars that I can think of that have these kind of very real ideas about what liberation could be. All right. Just my lights just dimmed. That was terrifying. One or two more here. Um, so this is from a Latina woman who lives in Maine and she said uh, she has a friend who's white and supporting Black Lives Matter, but they're having a um, hard time discussing because her friend has told that she doesn't really know what black people experience with regard to racism. You know, as a Latina woman, she has experienced really, you know, horrific racially motivated behaviors in her life, but she seems to be unable to conv convince the white friend that she does understand. She says, I really want to be open to educating myself. Therefore, am I seeing this through the wrong lens? So I can't speak to that as a white woman. I can't say that. I think <laughs> I really do not want to overstep in any way. And I can't, this is such a complicated challenge. I think the one thing that I could say is I, I don't think any of us could ever do enough to understand to try to understand and conceptualize the black experience in this country. I don't think any of us could ever do enough to do that. I, I know this sounds very simplistic, but my Instagram stories, I have people that I watch every day. These are black. I watch black stories on Instagram. Scholars, black activists, um, you know, black culture writers, black artists who are talking very frankly about their own experience. And for me, it has just been bearing witness to those experiences. Now it's on Instagram live. So, you know, it, it, a lot of people are bearing witness, but I think the more and more we bear witness to the stories that black people and people of color are putting out there, the more we can begin to understand how we got to this moment we're at and what our complicity in it is. Um, I do think that my dog just howls. <laughs> I do. I do think her dog just told her she was wrong. I think that, um, Again, it, it, it might be worth it to have a conversation with your friend about what it means to kind of play the, play the you're, you're not the most oppressed person of color group in this country, so you don't know. It, it, it doesn't sound that simplistic, but while there is absolutely a profound anti-Blackness sewn up in the American history and in our current day because of slavery, that doesn't in any way diminish the struggles that you have experienced as a Latinx individual. <laughs> And so for her to kind of say, but you have an experience Dogs that are enslaved. diminishes your lived experience. And I think that that's something that you, you should probably bring. Dogs are oppressed. Up with her while also doing your own work to fully understand the complexities of anti-blackness as they make themselves manifest today. Okay. I'm going to have this be the last question. And then I definitely for the other people who did not get their questions answered, because there's more here that we just didn't get to. No, there's not. Um, we will download them and, you know, communicate with Kate about if there's ways to answer them. But the last question is, and I love this question, <laughs> um, how do you keep faith in humanity after watching the news? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I'm only laughing because Jen knows <laughs> that mine has been tested. Um, That's a very heavy question to finish with. I think for me, quite frankly, it is very hard as someone who studies history of race and racism to not feel as if the long arc of history will never bend towards justice in this country. Oh my God. If the long arc of history did not bend towards justice, we would still have slavery and the civil rights movement would have never happened. What the hell are you talking about? It is very hard not to feel that. It is very hard to not look at the news now and just think these are the same, same old, same old. I think that in many ways we have to, in some ways we have to focus on the 
minor wins that we've had. And there have been some. Historically, of course, there have been amendments that have passed. The, the voting, the voter... Oh, so of course we've had victories. Of course. Of course. The Voting Right Act, I, I might not even be getting that right. Um, you know, these are very, very real victories that have happened, the desegregation of schools, and all of them are fraught victories, right? They have all come with their own complications and challenges, and some might even argue that they're, they're, they're stalemates, you know, they're not even really victories, but I think that you can't negate them. The other thing, and I know this sounds... Almost every Latino person I've ever talked to about the term Latinx hates the term Latinx. So I'm going to listen to the lived experiences of Latino people and not use the term Latin X to be respectful and anti-racist. Really, really white for me to say is that I am seeking out not just stories of Black oppression and the oppression of people of color. I listen to podcasts by Black women and women of color that make me laugh my ass off. Excuse me, pardon my French. That have absolutely nothing to do with the current moment they're in, but they're a reflection of black joy. I read books. A reflection of black joy. By black authors like Samantha Irby, or, you know, I read Roxane Gay's Goodreads uh, reviews, and she's got a thing for Channing Tatum. And I, I'm saying this as like an example. It's racist for her to like Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum is white. To just say, to, to, Look at the moment we're at right now and say this is an indicator that there is an absence of Black joy or Black creativity or Black thriving or the thriving or creativity. I think Cuban food is like the best thing that's ever happened. I'm probably racist for thinking that. I just feel like the need to confess. I think Cuban food is like the greatest. I'm sure I'm racist. The or joy of people of color in this country is is dead wrong. <laughs> is dead wrong. So I think put yourself in the way of people that are that are putting this joy out there as well and recognize that black people and people of color have always thrived in this country in in ways. It, even despite the unbelievable systemic oppression they face, they haven't just survived. Many of them have thrived. And so Focus on that as well, without detracting from the moment we're in and all the work that we as white people have. Mexican food is also pretty good, Sun King. I had Mexican last night. Chorizo, the best. Have to do to still continue to dismantle these systems. Peruvian food is good too. Oh, shit. Sorry. Oh, my God. Oh, I was so focused on food. I was like not listening. Okay. Peruvian food is good too. Ceviche is awesome. Unbelievable systemic oppression they face. They haven't just survived. Many of them have thrived. And so you can tell things have gotten totally off track when we're talking about food. Focus on that as well, without (laughs) detracting from the moment we're in and all the work that we as white people have to do. Indian food is good, too. Like Thai food's okay. Like Indian food is like, you know, Indian food is pretty good. Still continue to dismantle these systems. The ultimate goal is that all black people and people of color can thrive. All of them. Not just a, not just some of them. I would also like Asian people to thrive. I'd like Native Americans to thrive. I would even like white people to thrive. I want everyone to thrive. Not just some of them can feel joy. Not some of them can just creep. <gasps> Adrian, we can't be friends anymore. What are you talking about? Sushi is amazing. Sushi is amazing. What are you... Oh. Eight and have space to to thrive and be successful and feel joy and feel the whole human experience. But there are black people and people of color in this country, too many, far, far, far too many that are just surviving. And so that's, that's the ultimate goal of liberation, right? That was a, that was a heavy one to end on Jen. Wow. I know. Sorry. And you almost <laughs> made it through the whole thing without swearing. <laughs> it was like, she, she gave her a layup as her final question. And she even made that one doom and gloom. It was like, she could have ended on like a happy note, but she was like, no, all white people are bad. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it was so close. I tried so hard. I'm sorry. It was so close. <laughs> um, okay. So. <gasps> Thank you to everybody. Like- I just want to note real quick that we have her email address on the screen and uh, the Institute for Recruitment of Teachers website right there. Just saying. Like I said, we will look at those questions. We can download them that we did not get to. And here's some information about Kate. I'm not saying that you should email her. Don't harass anyone. 
don't do it. Don't do it. I do not condone harassment. I do not condone violence. I do not condone threats of violence. I do not condone any of those things. Don't be a dick. But she put her email address on the internet, so it is what it is. Uh, slide showing right now. We will send you uh, quite a bit of follow-up information via an email. And this way- I am going to invite her on. I'm not joking about that. I really am. I'm going to reach out to her. I have her email address now. The webinar has been recorded, so we will have it online in a couple of days. If there's anybody you feel missed it and would benefit from it, we'd love you to uh, tell them to tune in online as well. Yes. So thank you so much, Kate, for taking all this time preparing and presenting right now. This was yes. Thank you. Thank you for taking all that time at 5 a.m. to prepare the four S's of which two are the same and to put together one slide. Thank you, Kate. It's really. All right. That's basically all we have for today, guys. Um, yeah, that was that was everything I hoped it would be and uh, possibly much more. Well, guys, that's all we have for right now. If you enjoyed this live stream, I hope you'll give it a thumbs up. Thank you to everyone who sent in super chats. I greatly appreciate it. Your support allows me to spend all my time fighting back against this nonsense. And it really does mean the world. I, 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 I definitely appreciate it. If you feel like it, make sure you check out my locals, kb.locals.com. I will put it in the chat. Again, a lot of my locals community members are here right now, and we have a great time. We do Zoom chats twice a week where you can come on, interact with me, interact with the rest of the members of the community. We just talk about like whatever's on our minds. It's awesome. Lots of good people. It's like a little support group where we can complain about everything that's wrong with the world. Um, next week on Monday, on Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern time, I will be having a live stream with two amazing women. I will have on Jody Shaw of Smith College whistleblower fame. And I will also have on Gabrielle Clark, who is the mother in Nevada that is currently suing her son's school. That's going to be Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Please join me for that. And yeah, I hope you guys have a great weekend. That's all I've got for right now. I'll see you soon. Thank you, Kathy, for that last minute super chat.